Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you to the beginning of a new series of Talking Policies. Uh, some of you may know we had this series in 2020 and took a long break last year. I'm Akhtar Mahmoud, by the way, and I'm delighted to be able to resume this series. And we could not have asked for a more esteemed guest than Professor Stefan Derkon. Professor Derkon has very kindly uh, allowed me to address him by his first name, uh, which probably is not very inappropriate because we were, we had actually overlapped at Oxford many years ago. Our paths did not cross at that time. Maybe they did, and we didn't quite notice that. <laughs> but uh, here we are, 30 years later, catching up on what could have been a conversation in our more youthful days, relatively more youthful days, I would say. Uh, and it's, it's very appropriate that uh, this is being organized by the Youth Policy Forum. So what we could have done in our youthful days is now we are doing it at least uh, hosted by the Youth Policy Forum. So perhaps, uh, Stefan, you wouldn't mind if I just say a little bit about the Youth Policy Forum before I introduce you. Uh, the Youth Policy Forum actually was uh, conceived of by one of your TEFL students now, Abir Hassan, who having studied at the school where you are now a professor, the Blavatnik School of Government, and having been exposed to the very high quality and stimulating uh, training in public policy, he said, how can I bring at least some of that flavor to the hundreds and thousands of young Bangladeshis who would probably not get an opportunity to go to Oxford or some other high quality school of public policy. So he founded along with a few others, the Youth Policy Forum exactly four years ago. And I have been associated with it for about three years and it's been an amazing growth. I mean, they have about 20,000 members in Facebook, so tremendous outreach with dozens and dozens and possibly hundreds of young people who are spending a lot of time organizing and participating in the activities. And, and they have a number of ways in which they try to learn about policy issues and the art and science of policy making. They have seminars and webinars. But it's very interesting that they have recently even gone into the grassroots level. So they have a very interesting initiative where they go into certain constituencies of members of parliament. And I mentioned that because it all started because an MP wanted the young people to go into his constituency, study things at the grassroots level and come back and give him an independent view of what's going on in his constituency, what the issues are and what might the solutions be. And now that has been picked up by other MPs. So I think YPF is now working with at least three or four members of parliament on how they can have this grassroots experience, which is good for them, but which hopefully provides some insights to the members of parliament. So this started as an exercise for the young people of Bangladesh to learn about policy, but now they are actually going into even advocacy and hopefully doing in some way something which helps uh, move the needle. So they're straddling both worlds. And I think that's a good segue to introducing you because you have been straddling both the worlds of academia and that of development policy and management for over three decades now. So you are now a professor of economic policy at the Blavatnik School of Government and the Economics Department at Oxford. And I believe you're also directing the Center for African Studies uh, at Oxford. Uh, but you were also with the UK Department for International Development, which used to be known more by its acronym DFID from, I think, 2012 to 2017. You were the chief economist uh, of DFID. And then, from, and then, of course, we know that DFID was absorbed into the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office, which is now called the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office which itself is an interesting subject, the effort to align foreign policy and development, uh, which is a noble objective, whether uh, absorbing a development uh, organization into the foreign office is a good idea or not. I presume there's been a lot of debate in the UK, and uh, if we have time, we may touch upon it. But you were a policy advisor there from 2020 till very recently, and you have advised, I presume, at least two foreign secretaries, if not more. Uh, there's been a lot of transition in the foreign office, we know, in the last few years. But that's good for you because you get to interact with um, more than one foreign secretary. I'm sure they are quite different in their outlooks. So you have straddled both worlds. And, and, and that's why it's really remarkable that you have now brought together 
the rich perspectives, the rich experience from both academia and the practical world of development policy and management. Uh, and that has and that that really comes out very clearly in your book, the latest book which I have. Let me just show it to people: Gambling on Development, Why Some Countries Win and Others Lose. It's fresh, hot of the press. Fascinating book. I'm not surprised that it went out of print within a few days of being published, but thank God it has been. I think the second print uh, has come. And Abir very kindly sent this copy to me all the way from England because here in America, uh, we are not yet in a position to get it. Fascinating book. There is a chapter also in Bangladesh and we'll, we'll touch upon that. So without much ado, let's, let's start the conversation. Uh, we have about 40 minutes uh, for us to talk about the book and then uh, hopefully another 10 to 15 minutes where we can take questions, questions from the audience. So if I may just jump in and I, I would like to quote the very first sentence of your book in the introduction. And you say, a decade or so ago, I came to a realization. I needed to radically rethink how development comes about. And the question is, what brought you to this realization? Uh, well, well, thank you, Akta, for this uh, very kind introduction. and and. Um... Yes, it's uh, it, it was something um, you know ten years ago when I started working more and more in the policy space. I really also really felt that a lot of my academic knowledge was not really ready to be applied to what was happening in the world, and and in particular, you know, as an economist, as a kind of a technical economist, we like to um, describe perfection. We like to give very clear advice and these and the kind of lists of things that countries need to do. And we have theories, we have empirics that say, look, if you do that, it really will change things. And I think what the realization was is that it's probably two things that came together. Is on the one hand, uh, and I was definitely when I was traveling in, in China, you know, what is being done is not necessarily textbook economics. It's not necessarily textbook uh, advice that we would be giving to these places. But actually, whether it's in China, and I'm talking here of some of the complexities of rural development and land policies I was looking at at the time, you know, they were actually rather successful despite quite imperfect policies. While then in contrast, some places that claimed to go and follow the perfect policies, where you would go to the ministries and they tell me the perfect plans of all the things that we're going to do, actually very little gets achieved. And where I thought I really had to start rethinking it is that it's almost like one simple but fundamental precondition of development. It's not the list of things that they're going to do or announce that they're going to do the things they write in the plan, but actually is a fundamental commitment from those who have power and influence in a country to actually want to do development. And in a lot of the writing we do in economics, or a lot of the policy advice we give, whether it's as DFID or FCDO, or maybe when you were working in the World Bank, we kind of forget that. We assume that those we give advice to actually are quite interested in doing this. And actually, that's really was the realization. We have to start to begin with, with understanding, you know, what drives the policymaker to do what they're doing. And I think that was probably the kind of fundamental realization that even in China, look, these policies, what they were doing was probably not the best possible thing you could do. But there was a fundamental commitment to see it through and to actually try to be successful and to try to change your mind if it doesn't quite work and adapt and correct and doing things. And I think it was the realization that maybe we focus too much on what needs to be done, but actually we didn't think enough about how and why it gets done. And that was probably the biggest realization I had starting to work in the policy space, understanding how they do it, but also why they do it and why they don't do it. And I think that's probably was the big realization for myself. 
Right. So the how and why they do it is actually going to be the core of our discussion today. But before that, you know, in, in, in chapter one, you have an excellent summary of the, the thoughts of some of the leading development practitioners of our time. Um, I don't know whether in three or four minutes you can summarize some of that, but if you can, that would be very, very useful for, especially for the students who are listening in today. No, no it, it, yes, I'm, I'm actually rather pleased with, with, with having that chapter. And I want to be very clear, these are not necessarily a review of the, the thinkers that are necessarily are the best thinkers on development. This is not a value judgment. So I have actually, as a first chapter, I kind of review the bestsellers in economic development. You know, I have the books by Jeff Sachs or Paul Collier or uh, Asimoglu and Robinson, Why Nations Fail, or, you know, Debt Aid by Dan Bizamoyo or Angus Deaton writing his book uh, on it, or maybe Danny Roderick. And, and it's basically authors like that, that when you go into even 10 years after they were published and you go to the bestseller lists in Amazon, they're still buying these books. You know, these are, this is a bit of the canon of the kind of generalist writing about economic development that, and I will say, you know, many students read it. They are very well written books. They're very interesting. But what's very striking, of course, these are all very big minds in economics. Some of them have won Nobel Prizes. Uh, you know, others would definitely be very respected. Um, I think the essence is that they actually take a stance of how they think about the fundamental problem of development. And maybe as a quick summary, I would say, you know, that there's probably, I, I consider four different ways of looking at them. Let me summarize in two points. So there is one group of people that basically, and they're very influential these days, and, and it's probably mainly led by these days by Daron Asimoglu and James Robinson's book of Why Nations Fail, published about 10 years ago, where fundamentally they say, look, you get development requires good institutions, and only if you have inclusive institutions in a country in political terms, in economic terms, you can get development. And success story in the world, they would have inclusive institutions. And they say, on the other hand, you could have institutions that are fundamentally extractive, really bad for people with poor rule of law, bad property rights, very unclear, the kind of things that we would recognize as kind of not very good, extractive, maybe exploitative of people. If you have that, nothing will happen to you. So it's basically a strong institutional view of development. And I think it's very important in the policy space uh, very influential in, 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 in terms. Now, my comment on it would be is that, of course, it's really important to get these institutions right. Um, but at the same time, there's, there's, there's two problems with it. When a country doesn't have them, their main explanations of the, the main explanation of this view is typically it comes out of history. And it's a bit like as if you get a, if advice, you know, when I done as an advice to a country, say, oh, this is your book you need to try to follow. Why don't you buy yourself a better history? Or why don't you restart your history? Now, you can't go to a policymaker and say, you know, your history is rubbish. Now let's mm -hmm. start again. And it's a really very pessimistic view of development, I would say. But something that gives me hope as well in it is that what they don't explain in this view is actually... But why then in China something changed fundamentally in 1979? If it's all history, why 1979? And why not 1650 or 1962? Why is it then 1979? And that's already an important point for me. Is then the interview is definitely my view on it to say I, I love this whole thinking about institutions and the role of history. Of course, it matters. But at some point, the agency of policymakers will, will matter. So that's probably one group of people and some, because that institutional view sometimes gets people very pessimistic, like Belize, the league, that's all very gloomy and you can't do anything and development corporation has no role, it makes it only worse and so on. But actually, once you start thinking, you know, there are moments that actually there is an agency of the actors of the policymakers that change something. So there is something there that you want to understand better. Then you may actually say, well, maybe it's the other view that actually you need to then take into account, which is more, more maybe the view that, you know, writers like Joe Stiglitz or Paul Collier, all in very different way, Danny Roderick and so on, would, would have is to say, look, it's actually what you do, the policies you do will matter. 
now and it's the policies you do at a particular moment in time that matters and and Danny Roderick has a very nice line I don't quite quote it in the book but it's actually a very nice line in a blog at some point that he says look I keep on explaining all the things they may need to do but they don't but I don't understand why why governments don't do these things because it's all self-evident and actually that's the weakness of that view it doesn't ask itself you know why why do they not do it and sometimes development economists all the way even to the micro ones you know like uh abhijit Banerjee and esther duflo they kind of say that they, they they tend towards suggesting as if there is some ignorance on the form of the policy makers as long as we give them the list of things to do you can do like in 1979 in china or in the early 1970s in indonesia or in India, somewhere in the in the in the early 1990s, you suddenly get it right, and as if it's ignorance. No, I don't believe in the ignorance view of economic policy making. I think there's a lot of countries we deal with that actually know pretty well what they're doing, and they pretty well know that they're not doing development or growth because of for other reasons. I maybe stop that. That's a bit like my summary. You can put yeah, these books all in the context. They tell us what you should be doing, but they actually don't really answer. Why doesn't it happen, or why does it happen sometimes at some point in time and not another time? Right, right. And you also mentioned writers who had said that let's just stop eight, perhaps for even five years and see what happens. And then there are others, I think Stiglitz is one of them who says that there are a lot of problems at the global level beyond the control of individual policymakers in individual countries. And perhaps that's where we should be working. And you do a critique of that, that view as well. Yes. Uh, so yes, Stefan, I definitely, I definitely yes. do a critique on this kind of simplistic view. You mm -hmm. know, as long as we give aid, everything will be sorted. And there's sometimes maybe a less generous way of me re reading Jeff Sachs is that that kind of the emphasis all the time, aid will fix it, development finance will fix it, is definitely something throughout the book I really worry about. And I've worked in this sector now long enough. You know, it's not as simple as that as just writing checks and, and the transfer. Um, I have sympathy with Joe Stiglitz's thing that there are in the international space things that go wrong. But one thing that he can't unexplain in his framework, why is it then that, and we'll, I'm sure we'll come back to it, a country like Bangladesh ended up doing quite well, why a country like Myanmar in the broad region doesn't do very well? And that's actually, you know, that can't just be the international institutions because some countries have taken advantage of opportunities and others haven't. Yes. But you, of course, you don't deny that there are things that need to be done at the international level and towards the end of your uh, book uh, uh, you talk about it and we'll, we'll come to that that point. So let's come to Stefan to the the core thesis of your book about elite bargains. So uh, we're all very curious to know what, what what exactly do you mean by elite bargain? What are they bargaining about? And why is there a gamble involved in it? Gamble means there's also a risk. So what are the risks? So it's the whole concept of elite bargaining. So, so this is a bit like my, my fundamental kind of mental model, my worldview on the way I like to look at states. Okay, so there's many lenses we can use when we look at a state, a country that we try to work with or that we live in. But one important lens, I think, is to actually consider that, you know, in every country, there are people that I tend to call the elite, but not necessarily in a pejorative way. Mm -hmm. It's more like, you know, people with power and influence in that society. You know, this will be people in the political space, but I didn't want to talk about leaders because then we always reduce it just to the political leaders. It can also be people in business, maybe in the military, in the countries where that matters a lot. Uh, it could be civil society. It could be, of course, civil servants, senior civil servants. It could be people in academia, leading thinkers, journalists. Somehow or another, they kind of shape a country at any moment in time. They have power and influence. So one of the things is that the question you ask that at any moment in time, what is the society of, and, and, and that they shape? Now, it's not simply something about the political system. It's something to do with, you know, the way the society and the economy and everything functions. And the elite bargain is essentially the kind of dominant view in terms of, you know, how is control managed in the politics and how is control or not control in the economy handled? Who has access to resources? Who gets the gains from something? You know, is it uh, is it restricted? Who can do certain jobs? Do you need to know someone in government to be able to do certain activity? Uh, 
what how do you use the state do you use the state as an instrument to creating jobs for your friends or actually do you do you operate the state in a much more open way is it very meritocratic you know these are the kind of things that in the end at any moment in time the elite seems to be determining and interpreting of course historical factors like an institutional view they matter but actually at any moment in time these get reinterpreted and 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 and, pr and practiced now that's generally so you could have all kinds of elite bargains some that look like um you know kleptocracies where a small group of people just use their their influence and power to actually steal from the whole population and stash it away somewhere in in a tax haven or you could have a very clientelist economy or society where where basically politics is all about you know trying to keep in power and rewarding those who support you, you could have a very patronage based based uh, uh aspects and so on you could have a very much a political system based on democracy, but actually politics being so expensive that actually you need to have close links with, with business and lobbying plays a big role and so on. Now, I mentioned this broad range to it because I think every society has aspects of some of these and some more than others. And I say basically every society, you could think of it as an economic and political deal between the elites about it. Whether you go to the US or whether you go to India, whether you go to Bangladesh, whether we go to Ghana, whether you go to Belgium, my country of birth. And they all look a bit different and some aspects are more. Now, when I come now to development, I say, well, when will growth and development take place? Well, when you have actually an elite bargain where growth and development plays a central role in what the bargain is about, what is actually they're considering. And, and I have like three characteristics but the underlying one is to actually is a fundamental shared commitment to want to achieve growth and development. Now, to make sure this is not just words, it has to be a credible commitment to some form of peace and stability, the minimal requirement for a state. It has to be also a sensible way of thinking about the state. I call this a self-aware state that actually, to some extent, tries to serve this growth and development. Now, you could have a very large and big state that is very heavily structured well in not all countries you could use that to do development because sometimes that state may be very clientelist may be very much based on jobs for the boys or alternatively you could go to like in china where it actually is very meritocratic historically two thousand years of public exams to get into the senior civil service two thousand years of history of central taxation so I'm not surprised that the Communist Party of China at some point decided, let's use the state to develop, because actually you have a history of a strong state, you can do this. But what I basically say is that in every country, this will be a bit different. You better have a self-aware state. Of course, the state has to have sensible policies, but sometimes it will take more charge of the economy and the, the way it develops. In other, in, other, in other places, it's maybe wise. I would say, for example, for an African country, states tend to be quite weak. I would not encourage them to try to do a China because actually the states are weak. So I call this, you need a state serving growth and development, but self-aware and realistic in terms of what you can bring. I saw the first point was a commitment to peace and stability, very serious and credible. The second, use the state sensibly. And the third one is to avoid that this is just all about ideology and say, I want to grow and I want to be rich. You have to have a state that's willing to learn, to correct, that could be an internal accountability, like you have maybe in China, learning within the Communist Party and being punished and rewarded if you're successful. Or it could be accountability, maybe as in Ghana, which is a relatively successful country in recent times. But actually, it comes through the electoral system. Actually, democracy helps for some accountability that actually does a correction. So you need to have one way or another for an error correction thing. So I think that's what I mean by the idea of an elite bargain for growth and development. And it's the one that I call a development bargain. So basically, you need to have that. Now, that's not a perfect set of institutions. That's not a choice between it must be the market versus the state. No, it's actually adapted to the circumstances. This is not about autocracy versus democracy, because unfortunately, I know plenty of democracies that I don't have an elite bargain for growth and development. I think of Malawi. I don't think they have it. Um, could name other countries as well. Similarly, an autocracy, you know, we, we can't deny that China is quite autocratic and actually quite successful. So you can't simply say it can't be done 
We also know, of course, that we could go to say that the Congo, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, pretty autocratic, poorly run country, not very democratic, and it does terribly on these things. So it's actually not a matter of the political system, market versus the state, or indeed having perfect institutions, but it actually is somehow finding the way to do it. And, it, and it's important to remember that the institutions don't have to be perfect. In fact, many of the success stories, and I would say including Bangladesh, yes. had a lot of imperfections when they were doing this. So it's much more to do in terms of how pragmatically you work with the imperfections rather than having this idea, wait for history to catch up, and now we have perfect institutions, now we can start to take off in development. So that's very, very refreshing and very reassuring. Refreshing in the sense that you're taking us beyond the the, the usual dichotomy between authoritarian and democratic governments and that sterile debate. And it's reassuring because you're telling us that you don't have to have perfect institutions because most of the developing countries do not have that, but there is a way out. And, and we'll probably uh, uh, delve into that when we discuss Bangladesh in a moment. Uh, by the way, to those who are listening, uh, if you have any questions, do put it in the chat box so we can pick as many as we, we can. But coming back to the concept, Stefan, of um, elite bargain, when we hear the term uh, bargain, uh, uh, elite bargain, um, it conjures a certain image of a group of people, perhaps in a smoke-filled room, sitting together, having deliberations, perhaps for weeks or months, and at the end of the process, they come out, and here they have a signed paper, a declaration, a communique, whatever, which gives the, the details of the bargain and what they're going to do. And if that was the scenario, we'd all know when that bargain has been reached and what that bargain is all about. But clearly, that's not how it happens, yeah. which also makes it very difficult to actually say that, well, here in this country, there was indeed a bargain. Because to be frank, Stefan, when I was reading your country chapters, and mm -hmm. I, I confess I may have missed a few things, Sometimes there was an appearance of a tautology that you have said, okay, uh, if you have a development bargain, you're going to have growth. And then in the chapters, you say, okay, these countries have growth and they had certain policies which are growth enhancing. So surely they had a development bargain, but I'm sure you can, you can do better than that. And if I read your chapters more carefully, I'll probably understand. But nonetheless, that's a question. And if somebody wants to build upon your work and do in-depth studies in countries, and they want to make an effort to establish that her bargain uh, was struck. And by the way, and we picked this theme up as well. I mean, it's not a one point in time when the bargain is struck. Uh, but, but if you can comment on that, on how do we really understand when a bargain is happening? Yes. No, no. And, it, and it's, of course, an excellent point. And, and, and maybe, of course, there is an element of, a, of, a, of, of trying to have a relatively clear framework. But of course, as you correctly pick up, have a clear framework of development bargains or, or, or different type of elite bargain doesn't mean that applying it never doesn't have gray zones there. And so, so what I would actually, but why I, why I still want to stick to it and actually, you know, of course I will defend my position here in, in, in it. It's actually in the following sense. You know, if we, if we take this kind of historical view, the kind of institutional view, the bit of Asimov de Robinson, then, of course, you invite this idea, oh, well, I can have maybe some clear historical predictors of, 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 um, of, of why it would happen. And, of course, these things will still play a role, you know. Uh, how do you overcome some kind of historical impediments to do it? And it are, 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 is information that you can use to assess, is there a development back? But the additional factor that I really think is so central here is the agency of the actors at that particular moment in time, that they actually do it. So, it, so you know, you, it means you can't have a simple, as we would love to do, have a set of indicators we can do in, in technical terms, some kind of statistical predictions of it, because all these indicators are there from five years earlier. Now I can predict the bargain will be struck now, kind of informally. No, it actually isn't. Because it is a world, and it is like a bit like what you often think in game theory, the presence of multiple equilibrium, multiple in political science, actually people talk about political settlements, polit different political settlements that are possible. And it involves actors somehow finding a way of coordinating to get to a, a, to a better or to a worse equilibrium. And of course, 
that also means it's not you can't make it nar narrowly predictable, but we can begin to observe it. And that's the, the argument I want to make. So if someone wants to see what, what is the elite bargain doing at the moment, you know, you will know in every country, you will know certain things that if they start reforming that, there's a massive amount of vested interest in, in something. You know, it could be in certain countries, the reform of an agricultural subsidy policy that gets captured by a particular class of landowning, rich landowners or something, or a certain set of policies. You know, you, you've worked in the World Bank in that kind of thing. We can identify often areas where there's a lot of vested interests that are very hard to unpick. Now, my, one of my signals would be, is a country that's willing to start on picking this and makes it a real priority to try to do it. And of course, it needs to be able to see it through. So you start looking at the kind of, you know, not intent, but actually the actions it takes, the behaviors it has, and whether it does enough of them to actually say, look, this is actually begins to unpick the whole thing. This is actually some kind of change. So that's what I would kind of allude to. You start looking at at the actions and if you can to some of the outcomes that begin to emerge of course once you start seeing that over a while you know i i definitely lived through the emergence of an elite bargain for development in ethiopia working there quite intensively after 2005 where it started with clearly statements of intent of wanting to really get legitimacy for actually not a terribly uh, pretty political outcome, a political deal in the country, to getting more legitimacy from it and actually really betting on growth and development, to actually the sets of actions, the kind of indicators when they start seeing it through. So that actually some years later, I would say I would date it, say around 2005 it started. By 2007 or 8, we were quite confident there was something here seriously happening. And, and the kind of dialogue that organization like the World Bank used to have, we as DFID as well, you clearly said, look, this is actually serious. And actually one of the, my points of regrets on Ethiopia, for example, is that we didn't really manage to find the mechanism to increase the support to that. And in fact, given what happened subsequently, they haven't quite been able to deliver because there was too much impatience in the political space and actually the, the political elite bargain fell apart. And it's, and it's really kind of an interesting thing to actually do this. So, so that's what I want to allude to, is actually to say, look, you start observing it in both in intent, but also some of the actions and the beginning to see of the seeds of it. Because it is about, you know, agency, you know, um, technically, as an economist, I would say a multiple equilibrium is hard to predict. You don't know necessarily which one, if there's two Nash equilibriums, you don't know which one they will go for. And they will be able to do with strategic behavior and so on, and coalition formation, at least in certain types of modeling. So it's there. Can I allude to actually something I didn't ask? So why is that a gamble? And I want to just yeah. pick that up, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because when you start doing that, and whether it's in Ethiopia or in other countries, you just don't know whether it's going to work. You actually gamble with the survival sometimes even of a regime, which had actually happened in Ethiopia. But even in China, you know, they came out of conflict with the Cultural Revolution, the, the death of Mao in the 1970s and then the Gang of Four. By the time they got to 1979, this was not just a country with very undermined institutions. They were very poorly functioning at the time and it was very unclear where it would go. But it was actually a matter of, you know, they were risking not being able to survive. But that was a real gamble to say, look, we're going to reestablish the legitimacy of our of the Communist Party through growth and development in a way that nobody had ever tried to do it. And it actually, in general, the political dynamics of growth are actually quite complicated because, you know, some people will gain, some people will lose from the kind of growth oriented policies. Mm -hmm. Vested interest may lose and so on. That's the gamble because you may lose your coalition for change. Because rather than actually distributing what you have at this moment, a bit like this kind of, you know, getting certain people something and other people something else from what you have, you start investing it in the future and hoping that it gives a larger return in the future. That's a gamble. All, all investment is with uncertainty. And that's why it is a gamble also politically for your elite party. Yeah. We'll pick that up in a moment when we when, when we come to Bangladesh. But when you said bargain, I mean, of course, the elite class is not monolithic. Yeah. So there are different groups with different interests and different ways of looking at this situation. So there's a, there's a bit of bargaining going on between themselves as well. And I'm giving up something in return for something, etc. I mean, can you cite an example of where such a bargaining happened within the elite class? 
Well, yes. And, and again, you know, you alluded to it very correctly earlier. That is all quite implicit. And it's like, because, you know, all the time, those, and it often is some technocrats, maybe some political leaders, some business leaders that actually maneuver this space. You know, it's a it's a precarious balance. You know, it keeps on changing and, and so on. And um, and so I, I'm thinking, for example, of Indonesia in the early 1970s. Mm -hmm. They came out of conflict as well. Uh, you know, the, and then uh, President Suharto came to power with a military coup. Actually, the old elite was really quite a, against what he did, taking power, because they were very supportive of the old nationalistic leader of Sukarno. And um, so he had actually, in that sense, not much legitimacy with the old elite, who had actually overseen total stagnation and not for nothing, the conflict in the 60s had a lot to do with people not seeing any benefits from progress in development uh, since independence. But meanwhile, so Harto also had to maneuver, had to find sources of growth, because it couldn't be the status quo. So he started inviting in FDI from overseas, especially from Japan, which was really poorly received by the established business elite. Actually, what's quite interesting that period, and in fact, Indonesia still has these hallmarks, you get this very strange maneuvering all the time by being open to newcomers in the elite and the new business elite. Meanwhile, allowing the old elite still to have a quite a lot of influence and power, not least through corruption and through jobs in the government, or to control of the oil, uh, the holding company that controls the oil revenue, which is known to be very corrupt. And even today we have regularly corruption scandals linked to it. But actually that's part of the elite deal that it actually has to be allowed to do because it keeps it all a bit together. So a kind of a condoning and if the corruption gets too big, there is a bit of punishment, but there is an element of keeping that elite somehow together. And this is all the time needing this, bring this together. So. So it actually leads to something that I do want to briefly mention. You know, corruption, I mean, of course, I'm not going to say this is beautiful and great. This is, this is a loss to the economy. But I also can understand that in political terms, in a political deal between elite players, it can sometimes be something that actually keeps things going and keep, and keep a bit of glue together. And so you need to have some kind of really understanding the nature of the corruption, what's going on, because what I don't like is an anti-corruption commission that basically puts every um, former president that has lost power through an election or something in jail for corruption, because that's usually just political deals as well. So you really want to be very careful to understand the role both of corruption, but also anti-corruption can play in that whole political elite bargaining and coalition of power that, that, that gets formed and so on. Very good point. Very interesting. We we have a question which is on bargaining. So maybe we take that question now uh, while we are still on that subject. And the question um, is a lot of elite bargaining appears to be intrastate within key stakeholders of the political system. Can foreign actors, ambassadors, international organizations also be a part of such an elite bargain? Does anything make their involvement in the bargain different? from domestic elites. We were going to come to the role of external actors later, but if you want to pick it up now, you can. Or... Yeah, I'll just pick it up very briefly. You know, that I, I got over tw on Twitter drawn into a conversation on Haiti historically. Mm -hmm. You know, foreign powers, not just in colonial times, but also in post-colonial times. You know, forgive my language, they screwed it up very badly. You know, there is French and, and US clearly we're kept on allying with different elite players and strengthening them and make it worse. So that is possible, okay? I also want to think of benign ways that international foreign actors can act. That doesn't have to be in this, this horrible way. One thing that I really like, and, and, and um, I'm sure it, it, it will sound familiar also to policymaking in, in, in Bangladesh, um, in many countries, you know, if, if there's an elite bargain for growth and development, you know, occasionally it will get derailed. You know, you will get, you know, you know, you know and not not every country actually, you put it like this, has managed the macroeconomy as carefully as as, as Bangladesh actually has in, in, in broadly in the last 20 years. And you basically get derailments. Indonesia had them regularly, Ghana had them and so on. So you get balance of payments, deficits and the whole thing. You know, within a kind of political economy setting, the IMF is actually a great player because it allows technocrats to align themselves with the Washington-based institutions to actually get difficult reforms through. And it allows the politicians to blame the IMF for it, which is okay because actually it's sometimes very hard to communicate and to admit that you yourself made the errors. So you can blame someone else for some of the hardship that it brings. So you can actually 
you in, in, in the most cunning ways, sometimes, and I do think there's some technocrats across the world in developing countries have done it beautifully. I write a little bit about it in the book that actually use the IMF really as I think it should be used to actually, you know, in a commitment for growth and development, look if then corrections needs to be made because some uh, massively unfortunate big spending happened on something they shouldn't really have done, some massive procurement scandal or whatever derails your macro because it derails your fiscal side, you can actually can bring them in to help with your correction without having to totally derail the, the progress that is made in the country. So so they can be they can be benign, they can be cunning, they can be things. So there is a role. Although I want to just emphasize, and I'm sure I'll mention it later again, what I want to be careful with, you know, let's not start with the outsiders. Actually, if we look at the experience of countries, the insiders shape a big part of it. And I want to make sure that we start from them, that we never say, oh, eight or outsiders are the ones that need to come and fix something here, because it will never work. It needs to come largely from inside. Yeah. Right. In fact, um, I once heard a permanent secretary of the finance ministry in Bangladesh uh, tell me the story of how a prime minister would often turn uh, to her finance minister during a cabinet discussion and say, OK, but what would the World Bank and IMF say about this? And, and the answer of the finance minister would often resolve the debate. Uh, <laughs> along the lines that you, you mentioned. Yeah, yes, indeed. Uh, we will come to the, the more nuanced role of external actors that you talk about in the last part of your book. We'll, we'll come towards that. But let, let's come to Bangladesh. Uh, I'd first like to hear from you the summary of your Bangladesh story. And then I have, uh, uh, I may, uh, well, not really push back, but I'll, I'll, I'll add a few things to that. Um, so yes. let's hear from you the Sorry. Yes, no, in fact, I mean, you have to push past it, make it more, it makes it more interesting. I mean, just my view is that, first of all, Bangladesh, you know, in a comparative sense, it is a success story. OK, we can't deny this. This is not a perfect uh, country, but in the last 20, 30 years, uh, you know, it's gone, gone from, you know, Henry Kissinger's uh, advisors calling it a basket case. Uh, to actually a country with, with sustained growth for, for a couple of decades, with actually remarkable improvements in, in development indicators in the way that actually, you know, has to be the envy of many other countries that started at the level of Bangladesh, not least because it looked so grim to start with. Um, and so so we need to bank that point, so to speak, that, that that's really important. And for me, it's a particular one because my very first essay that I ever had to write on development economics was the title I was given is Bangladesh a basket case and this was around 1982-83 and I answered yes of course it's a total basket case oh. <laughs> in the in that time and, and and I still have to laugh at myself that I was totally making the argument there was nothing going to come from it and so so Bangladesh is actually my my the poster child actually even when I go to Africa to say look this countries that look really grim complicated and really not going anywhere it seems at some moment in time with everybody worrying about the demographic uh, explosion that was supposed to be happening there and to actually be the successful so for me the, the success is in my framework it's actually saying well you know I mean we know the ingredients here you know we, we know that um, the garment sector has been an important part of actually getting kind of not just a really thriving growth engine that is export based but also embedding the idea of export orientation as, a, as an important direction for economic policy and both matter and i may come to that in a moment the second thing is that uh, even when the state wasn't necessarily providing social services uh, or social sector support in a very good way it allowed space for organizations like brac to emerge to actually being very important in this and you know i have enormous joy to be able to talk about brac always to other audiences you know the largest ngo in the world and it is a remarkable story but i'll put it in a moment in my framework and then probably the third one is that you know there was of course still quite a lot of excess labor and so on migration and remittances played a played a sensible role in it as well now you could say look these are some of these ingredients for me in my framework what is it that actually what is so remarkable? Why do I call it a development bargain in a way that's really worth looking at by other countries? So one thing that I find very striking, and, and I have had 
discussions already with with uh, Bangladeshi academics on on the exact interpretation. But clearly, something seems to have happened. First of all, after coming after independence and then the famine, and then actually a period of let's say political and economic call it misrule or chaos in the 1970s, a stabilization was obtained. Somehow it, 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 it started happening. And I do think in this bad period of the 1970s, maybe building on something that was present in Bangladeshi society already, but quite of a broad elite bargain seemed to have emerged that actually, you know, delivering for people matters, you know, and, and, and getting this country to be stable and to, to grow and develop is, is to do this. And so, you know, and it means that first condition, as I said, there's an elite bargain for some peace and stability. It seems to have forged itself. You know, we could talk about it, to what extent was this because of, 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 of uh, General Lershout, why, to what extent was it, to other means, how it achieved. But somehow or another, definitely in that period, a kind of a coalition, a broad coalition amongst the elite for peace and stability was, was forged. The second one is, this is the one that we will, I'm sure, later on debate, is to actually say, well, the role of the state within it, okay? And so I will actually want to say, the, and, and in fact, you've already supported part of my argument just with your earlier comment, which is actually say it's a very self-aware state, and remarkably so, okay? And so what I mean by is, compared to East Asian countries, this is not state-led development. This is actually development that is far much more allowing the market to, to thrive. You know, and to take one example is, you know, the garment industry, it wasn't captured by politics. We could argue maybe it captured politics later on, but that's another argument. But initially, initially, it definitely wasn't captured by politics. The space was there. I doubt that this would have happened in Pakistan or in India in the same way. Uh, and that actually is something there. That's what I mean by the self-aware state. It actually was cautious. In fact, what you just suggested in terms of what would the World Bank IMF do, I doubt that a cabinet meeting in Pakistan or in India would ever really have had that. And that actually is a kind of an awareness in terms of, look, let's not get in trouble with it. Let's actually be cautious, careful. And I think it led to quite an extent of laissez-faire and actually a kind of a, a market-led development uh, model that is much less state driven in the way we tend to understand it sometimes of a Chinese model or Vietnamese model. And then the third thing is, is another thing that you allude to already in, in some ways as well. It somehow, maybe it didn't make many corrections, but it actually seemed to avoid the uh, corrections. And in fact, your example will be quoted, I'm sure, in future talks in what happened in cabinet. You know, you avoid to have to correct by actually asking that question. You know, will it make sense later on or would we have to go to the IMF for support if we start starting doing these things? And actually, that's what I kind of mean. It makes it remarkable because it's not a statist model. It's a sensible uh, government. It's actually with an underlying commitment. It's hard to explain where it exactly came, but it was there and actually, you know, doing sensible things within it. And that's what I kind of would say, look, this is the development bargain in Bangladesh. And look, it is remarkable, given where you were uh, by the late 1970s. It is a remarkable achievement what was uh, what was obtained, and at least in the last, you know, 20, 30 years, what was achieved. So that's my Bangladesh story. But please go. Ahead. Right. So on on as uh, I mean, I'd written this blog in uh, Brookings uh, last year where I said that Bangladesh, in some ways, uh, did what Frank Sinatra song yeah. about. I I did it my own way, but. But certainly there was a dialogue also with the donors. And let me very quickly quote uh, from two gentlemen who had had possibly the most experience amongst Bangladeshi policymakers of interacting with, with donors. And one of them is currently the economic advisor to the prime minister, Dr. Mashur Rahman. And in an email exchange, he told me that the actors, and he met the government and the donors, shared a common vocabulary. And when they were able to come to a common vocabulary, that was a great help. Things things moved. So that, that's one, one important thing. Another gentleman, Mr. Sajid Zaman, who was also a permanent secretary in the Ministry of Finance for many years and finance minister and also sat on the board of the World Bank. He was talking about the, the policy loans of the uh, 70s and 80s called the import uh, program credits. And he was saying that the important feature of these credits and the policy reforms that were triggered but these were based on continuous dialogue between the government and IDA, the, the arm of the World Bank, and were being implemented in a gradual manner. In fact, in many cases, IDA staff members picked up 
on initiatives taken by the government itself in order to justify a policy-based import credit. So the government was already doing things and then the bank endorsed it and made it part of the policy credit also. So I think we have had a productive relationship despite certain frictions from time to time and, and complaints by either party. The Bangladesh side saying that uh, the donors are putting too much pressure on us and the donors saying that Bangladesh is not quite doing enough. But I think, I think at the end of the day, there has been a collaborative relationship uh, where there was a conversation um, between a dialogue, as Dr. Rahman said, a common vocabulary based on a common vocabulary. But th let me come back. Uh, sorry, please. You were no, no, this, this, is, uh, this, is, this is brilliant what you're actually saying. And these quotes are actually really probably the, the, uh, reflect the kind of spirit I want to actually say. Of course, in the end, you know, success in Bangladesh required good policies, needed sensible policy of the state. But it's also very, very striking in the examples uh, in, in, in what we know about the country. The, the, the country, it didn't try to do this kind of copying, say, some kind of state-led development. It was much more sensible, arguably much more sensible than India in, in doing it. It took so much more work in India to dismantle the Raj and the whole kind of thing. And actually, you were just more sensible. So, so I like that. This is why, why that, that term, the self-aware state, I do think is that I want to really think applies to Bangladesh. And it's a great example, you know, thinking through it, you know, you, you can't do it entirely, you couldn't do it entirely alone. And this is also what makes it really striking. I also call, for, for in terms of the aid relationship, the international finance relationship, you know, both Ghana and Bangladesh are my two success stories. They actually are the ones where we found a way of working together. And it had to do with both parties learning to be sensible with each other. And you took and you you did it your way and you led with it. That's yeah, that's the essence the essence for me for the, the the right relationship. You know, the country led and then donors should try to follow when when a sensible path is being followed. And and that makes it actually you know you the Bangladesh and Ghana are probably some of the few success stories in the international aid community. But it's but it's to do because the two partners were being sensible with each other. And um, yeah, it's a, a, an amazing self-awareness of your policy, of your policy making. In fact, on the self-awareness and doing it our own way, our very first leader, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, he had talked about a socialist economic system, but he always said that this will be our model. Now, he yes. didn't have time. He was sadly assassinated within three and a half years. We never got to see what that socialist model could have been like. We have seen the nationalization of policies and that was all. But... The fact that he always said that this is not going to be a model imported from abroad is going to be something uh, tailored to the context of the country. So that self-awareness of doing it in our own way while learning from others uh, have been there. But anyway, if I may, uh, you did give me the, the permission to push back a bit. <laughs> so what I want to do is on a couple of things uh, and very quickly. One is on agriculture. I mean, you do mention how the economy, the structure of the economy changed in Bangladesh and the share of agriculture in output and employment, all of that fail uh, over time. Uh, so in some ways you get the feeling, okay, Bangladesh did well because somehow it managed to escape from agriculture. Although you do say that, yes, rural incomes increased, but actually this is one thing that perhaps you, we could have, you could have discussed a bit more, that there was actually a transformation in the rural areas. And that, that process started a few years before the remittance and the garments story started. Maybe at the same time, Bragg uh, started its activities, but that started, and that still remains a very important pillar of Bangladesh's development. So I think that, that part of the story needs to be told a bit. The other is about the government's role. And I think there are two things here. One is the proactive role. So for example, there was a massive expansion of rural road networks in the 80s, and that apparently had a lot to do with the agricultural and rural transformation that I mentioned. There's a lot of investment in uh, agricultural uh, research and development by the public sector. So you have that where the government did certain things. And of course, you have that where the government actually withdrew, not only to create space for NGOs, but the agricultural input market liberalization of the late 80s and 90s is a case of withdrawal. Now, withdrawal is not always as passive as we may think, because if you have had a system for decades, a system of controls with all kinds of practices and uh, um, 
approaches and vested interests built around it, it does require quite a bit of courage and effort to withdraw. It's not just a, a passive thing. So that happened. But I just wanted to try out one thing, um, uh, which is based on some research I'm doing on Bangladesh. So it seems that in the very early days, the stance of the government, and I don't know how much of an elite bargain was behind it, is that we just need to do a little bit to, uh, to ensure a few things, that people don't die of hunger, there's peace and stability, and if we can enhance their livelihoods a bit more, that's good. So it's not a great ambition. Uh, so a bit of population control, ensuring food security, all that, and certain things were done, and a lot of that was through a public sector model initially. So delivery of agricultural inputs through a public sector model initially. What may have surprised the government is the response of the, of the people, the farmers, the small entrepreneurs, and there were waves and waves of entrepreneurial response. And as that response unfolded, it created demand for further policy actions, and the government then responded. Now, if there was a demand for 10 actions, the government did probably only three and said, mm -hmm. we want to try out, let's test the market, see what happens. But this series has played out and again and again in Bangladesh. And, and, and I was just wondering, when, when you have these feedback loops and we have these reaction mechanisms, I mean, this is, can also be part of an elite bargain. Also, it doesn't sound like a bargain struck at a moment in time, but things are happening. You do a little bit, you see the reaction, and then you respond again, right? Absolutely. I mean, and that, that's, that comes to that kind of the core part of it. You know, the error correction is not just technocratic. You know, you, you need to try out, you need to see how the, how the, how the politics of the, of the, of the how, how the different actors are responding technically, but also how the politics and the vested interests are changing. It's, it's this kind of, I mean, there's a real art of, of doing this. This is really not, this is not easy. The, the how is here, the hard one, not the what you need to do, but the how to do it. And to actually respond and to react to have the you know the, the right speed of reform, the sequencing. That's a really tough thing for an for for, for um, you know a, a, a bureaucratic leadership or even people in the business community to manage very well because that actually is what potentially can undermine the whole uh, the whole uh, elite bargain. And so that makes it really. That's why the how is so hard, you know. That is, is to, you know, it's easy to have the list of the things you need to do, the 20 reforms you need to do, but you need to kind of really think through where shall I start? If I do one, can I still do the second one? Does it actually stop the second the second one still not be possible anymore because the one is already too hard? And you know, and that's the kind of the interesting thing. And again, you know, this is this is I I, I really like the way you describe, you know, what what uh, what the state was doing. So so. And, and if I underplayed in the in the in the book how what I meant by the state being actually being an important actor, I because it in many of the things it didn't take the lead. Mm. You know, there's a lot of withdrawal. There's mm. a lot of careful withdrawal and so on. And that's probably the difference I want to make. So there's this sense and sometimes this narrative these days that everywhere there needs to be a developmental state. No, no, you can be developmental. Not to, without having this development state that needs to do, you know, a bit like Han, Han, Ju, Han Jun Chang kind of on Korea, the, the state really leading it and complicated ways of leading it and so on. No, no, this is actually maneuvering how you actually get entrepreneurship to happen by just about redrawing the right time and managing it. And I think that's why actually it's a more attractive uh, example because that underlying state wasn't really lower down wasn't functioning that well it was quite clientelist in bangladesh it was kind of not the right people and the capabilities were quite low there was corruption there's all the things so you you don't uh, put too much burden on delivery for them and look and if i may comment you know which country in the world allows an organization like brac become so big there is no country in the world that would allow it india wouldn't allow it pakistan wouldn't have allowed it no african country i know would allow it that's actually really striking that somehow the pragmatism of the state and those who are governing it was remarkable. And I think that needs to be applauded. And, and it's, it's the, the thing. So there's no disagreement here. And I'm, thank you for also alluding to some of the agricultural parts of the story, which I'm, as someone who starts in agricultural economics, I'm totally uh, with you to how important these things are.
Excellent. So we are running out of time. I don't know whether we can keep you for a little bit more than our five minutes, 10 minutes. We can. Excellent. Yes, because we have lots of questions coming up. Uh, let me move towards the last part of your book where you talk about the role of uh, external actors. And one thing which I picked up, uh, it seems that, okay, we can have three types of elite bargain situation. One which is a very well-established, strong elite bargain in favor of development. The other where is a very messy situation uh, where there isn't really an elite bargain. And then you have the intermediate situations where there is a bargain, perhaps a nascent bargain, but have a bargain which is still a little fragile. And if I understood you correctly, you seem to be saying that while foreign actors, donors and others have a role possibly in all three cases, it perhaps is most promising in the intermediate case. Uh, is that correct? Is that is my reading it's correct? A very fair, rare reason. And let me just summarize the simple thing is that, you know, when there is a development bargain, you know, global institutions like the, I, the World Bank IBRD or something, uh, maybe even IDA, you know, they should be willing to provide finance. You know, you can you can get these countries they will use the resources reasonably well. It's a little bit a situation like Bangladesh would find itself in. And I think, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if, if it didn't create bad incentives, which I can't judge on in Bangladesh, you know, ample finance for would have been the right approach to 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 to, to use in, in this period. On the other hand, the other extreme of countries where it's really tricky, the elite bargain is really tricky, there's a kleptocracy, they're just stealing from the people. There's no amount of conditionality, there's no amount of other things that actually will change that. You know, if they don't want to develop, but they just want to live off their diamonds or the natural resources, you're not going to get them wanting to diversify or not. It's in these countries, indeed, in between, where there's a kind of a push to do it. You should be willing, also as an outsider, to gamble on their development. So you should be willing to start supporting carefully, cautiously. And it's a gamble. You know, there's countries, a country that I don't work on a lot in Ethiopia. Yes, it got a bit derailed. And you, but I still don't regret that I would actually advocate ten years ago, advocated ten years ago, to strongly invest in these places because you know these things are difficult, politically difficult, it, it, and 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 so on. So yes, it's indeed the case. But across the board. I think my appeal is also when we do all these kind of investments, large scale aid via development finance or smaller scale, just think not just technically, like, oh, this is so many vaccines I can give to, to a Ministry of Health, but actually think about it, you know, what is the incentive I set here for the development bargain? Do I get do I make it a big, better chance that actually this will be now a better development or a more stable development bargain afterwards? Or actually, am I actually really giving an excuse to an elite not to do anything in health? Am I actually making it potentially worse? Do I get vested interest to can ignore it? And and that's also a little bit to have that there to have that political economy lens. Try to understand what the uh, uh, the the incentives are for the difficult for the different elite bargains that exist and for their potential change. And that's what I also want to allude to. It's like, let's not be just technocrats, for example, as economists. Let's not be just health experts, but actually make sure we understand how the country is functioning and what we do as outsiders, how it affects the internal incentives and the, and the, and the kind of networks of power and the coalition of power that you're actually working with. And that's, for example, very important for multilateral organizations who tend to work with the state. You know, you World Bank works sometimes with really odious regimes. And you have to ask yourself, should we do this? And how should we think about it? And they are definitely, if they're not developmental and odious in other ways, then you start wondering, you know, what are we doing here? You know, <laughs> what are we doing here? And that's probably what I appeal to. You know, many, many years ago in the World Bank, they used to have a category of officers called loan officers who are, in a sense, like program officers. And uh, in the 70s and maybe even the 80s, a lot of these were uh, mid-level civil servants coming from actually a disproportionate number came from South Asia, perhaps because they were good English speakers. But, but these people knew the politics. And I was told that when they were negotiating a loan, at the beginning, they will take the lead. And after having reached some agreement, they will hand it over to the technical people. But then again, they will come back at the end because the conversations at the beginning and the end 
required a lot of political insight. And in between, you could have technical conversations. So that kind of expertise have actually got depleted uh, over time. And therefore, the ability to understand the politics in organizations of the World Bank have become limited. Now, I know I was listening to one of the panel discussions you've had on the book recently. I think this was one of the discussions at Oxford. When one of your panelists, um, I think she was with DFID at one point, said that, uh, so this is all about being um, patient, humble, and brave. She was talking about uh, the approach that the donors uh, and other external actors would have. Patient because you need to have a long-term perspective. Humility because you don't really know all the answers. And brave because there's a lot of gambling involved, as you just said, for the donors. But I was wondering, and this is probably something you didn't deal with enough, is that the internal incentive mechanisms within organizations like the former DFID or the World Bank and the IMF probably don't lend themselves to the, the kind of approach that you're talking about. Don't you think so? I mean, there has to be some radical changes in the incentive structures in, in, in these organizations. Uh, no, I agree. I agree. And, and, you know, it's only from because I've been so much incited that I actually come quite bluntly out with the kind of concerns I have. Um, you know, I'm tempted to say that in the, there were days, in the, there were periods in DFID when it was really could be totally independent, not necessarily to the, um, um, not necessarily pleasing the political leaders in the, in, in the UK itself, but actually working quite independently. It could start doing this. And I think I definitely learned an awful lot from colleagues there. But the space to act can be quite limited. And of course, there's a lot in organizations like DFID that would spend based on need. You know, there's a lot of poor people. And actually, my argument is saying it can't be enough to simply say there's a lot of poor people. There's a lot of poor people in Nigeria and DRC, but I'm actually very, very cautious in terms of how we actually would work there and definitely not in grand finals. The World Bank similarly that ultimately works with a quota system, with some adjustment, but it's a quota system because it's essentially a cooperative bank. You know, all the members of a particular category will get, get their quota. So you get these strange situations that I think it's in period the last five years up to 19, 2019, that the three largest IDA recipients were Pakistan, DRC, and uh, Nigeria, which is definitely not on my list of countries with an emerging development bargain. Um, and actually countries that are aware there, uh, that would include Bangladesh or uh, Ethiopia then, and uh, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, and places like that, they were much lower down the list. And, uh, and that's actually something where the incentives are also set not very correctly. No, I appreciate that. And it is an issue of incentives. In the book, I actually talk about it. the same applies to Brussels, to the EU, or the same applies to Beijing. They also don't quite get it at the moment. They actually don't have differentiated models. And I think what I'm asking for is actually being willing to have more differentiated models. And of course, it's very hard in our institutions to do this. Probably easier for bilaterals than it is for multilaterals. But, you know, I come out of as a former chief economist, I want, you know, I'm not obsessed with data as the main solution, but if we give it, I want it to be well spent. And I think well spent has to be something. Is it really developmental or just like a band-aid? And then, uh, and that's why, why, why I come to this position. Very good. Let, let's, let's go on to some of the questions. We have several and we'll, we'll try to... Uh... Uh, you can take as many as you like, uh, and and then we uh, will we'll ra wrap it up. So um, um, let me see. Uh, well, there's one question which was on. Um, in your view, is there? Let me see. The question is. It's it's any. It, I'm happy to read that question. Why don't I actually read it out? Is there any similarity and overlap between okay. oligarchy and, and in ol uh, oligarchy? So yes, there is. You know. A kind of, you know, if you take on Russia, we all know about Russia these days. You know, if we think of it, we have a leader who is quite, he's in principle uh, democratically elected, but increasingly more autocratic. And one way of con con containing his power is actually through oligarchs. But that actually is basically what I'm alluding to. It's a politics and economics are totally intertwined. Uh, Putin can be in power because of all the economic interests that he can control. And it's this kind of mutual beneficial relationship 
the links with politics can keep the oligarchs in their position and the oligarchs are willing to support it. So it's a form of a, a lead, an elite bargain outcome that I would say described in, in Russia, which is very concerning, of course, uh, that we have it. So it's one potential elite bargain as we observe them. Yeah. Okay, so uh, maybe I'll read this out. In the 1970s, Rob, Robert McNamara had identified political will as the first condition for development. And more recently, Atche Moglu and Robinson provide agency to government and society in the narrow corridor. How would you differentiate your view from theirs? Yeah, so, so look, the, 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 the Robert McNamara, I mean, it's not rocket science to actually say political will matters, but you know, why I kept, why I use my concepts around the elite rather than political will is that we often reduce it to a pre president making a statement, I want growth and development or simply even an enlightened president being elected. But it may not be an elite bargain for growth and development because they actually may not have the ability, the power to act. So sometimes we focus too much on the political leadership, but actually political leadership is totally conditioned by the relationship of politics with the military, politics with the business, politics with the rest of civil society for their space of maneuvers. You know, we can even see that in democracies. You know, we have... Sometimes, you know, lots of people loved Obama. He had no space to act. He couldn't do anything because the elite bargain in the US includes big businesses that also make sure there's certain senators elected and, and, and certain seats and so on. He had no movement from maneuvery either in politics or in actually business interests. And so you you because of lobbying interests. So you 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 have to understand it needs to go beyond. Asimogli Robinson, well, you know, they 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 give a lot of they, they begin to at least acknowledge less uh, less the focus just on the history, and uh, and I'm a bit unkind, you know. They, these are smart people, of course, they know there is agency and they begin to allocate it. My view is quite different, more for the reasons I gave earlier. The underlying view of 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 what matters, their institutional view, the kind of slight of too much of a historical uh, determinism and so on. You know, but of course they're smart and they, they they can see it. And there is writings actually from both of them. And there's an article that is brilliant in in respect that's very similar to mine. But I think, um, yeah, I would actually say that the corridor is not as narrow as they like to define it. That question was from Ahmed Hassan, who also, like me, worked for many many years in the World Bank. Uh, the fourth. Question, I think you have already answered it. Uh, how are development-oriented elite bargains to reach? We, we had a bit of discussion on that. Uh, the next question is specific to Bangladesh. What have been the obstructions to Bangladesh achieving the, say, development commitments? So, so, so why don't I pick, and actually, I, I mean, for a moment, um, the... I'm actually for a moment go actually to that other question of how development bargains are reached okay. because you know why sometimes elites settle on it and I've not quite said it uh, but I gave the example of Bangladesh which probably has many of these elements but it often is on the back of conflict now on the back of conflict often conflict is the next outcome <laughs> the best predictor for civil war is past civil war but actually, it can be that a development bargain is reached as part of kind of trying to actually overcome this burden of conflict and, and instability. But related is that if you think of China, it was a lot to do with getting legitimacy from the population. And actually, that's actually another reason why an elite may want to settle for it is because they have want to have a, a legitimacy. Or it can actually be simple self-interest, really, is that they actually really see that those players in the elite and say, look, if we go for growth, We'll be richer afterwards and we will we probably suspect that we can keep power and we'll be richer so we take the gamble because this is such an opportunity to actually get richer and then we'll all be richer as well so it's a bit like and in the book i have a few examples where some kind of calculus like that may have happened in the bangladesh the obstructions i think you, you uh Akta, you alluded to it already and I, I don't think i'm going to go too deeply into it but I can I actually comment for a moment actually on the present day because one of the things I find very striking on Bangladesh is that you went through this first phase. And you remember I mentioned already is that initially I don't think the government exporters were that politically connected. Mm -hmm. But of course, now they are very strongly important. And we get a lot of policy making that actually is potentially 
favoring them over other sectors, including other potential uh, export sectors. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you have to keep on thinking about is these elite bargains for development, they will have to be renewed. And there are some tough decisions to be taken because despite the massive success over many, over many decades now of RMG, you need to diversify your export base. And clearly, what was the driver of success may potentially, I'm not trying to say they are, but potentially become the obstruction of future success. So it needs a very smart way of dealing with that, of how can we actually get them on board to maybe start doing other things, as we, as we actually see some of these entrepreneurs doing other export products as well and diversifying. How can we encourage that actually the diversification happen? Because that's not just an economic issue. It's actually a space to act for the, for the political class. How do we do that? Because they are very much important. So, so it's a bit like you need to, even when you get a middle income and when you get a middle income traps, you need to renew this kind of elite bargains because otherwise you may have done the first phase, but then you get stuck. You need to keep on renewing yeah. this and there. Yeah. And not only because the conditions are evolving, but because the, the composition of the elite may also be changing and there are aspirants, people who are, at the door of entering the elite class. And so, and so a renewal is needed. In fact, here I'd, I'd just like to say, I mean, in Bangladesh, we have probably had a policy stance which could be described as business friendly in the sense that there's a wide range of policies and public investments which are beneficial for the entire business class uh, or large sectors like garments is, is example you just mentioned. And what Bangladesh may need to do is to move more and more towards what I would call market-friendly policies, which introduce competition in the economy. And there is a risk that we may actually be moving in the other direction, which would be crony-friendly policies. And, and, and that's a real danger. And, and, and the whole world is becoming more and more complex. The economy is becoming complex. And as you said, we need to avoid falling into the middle-income trap. So, so I totally agree with you that the time may have come for a rethinking of the elite uh, bargain. And, and, and we have to make sure that the bargain moves in a direction which introduces competition rather than in a, the other direction uh, where it becomes more and more crony friendly. And there, there's always a risk, risk of, of that happening. Uh, there's another question on Bangladesh. Um, uh, we have undoubtedly made progress in Bangladesh in many sectors and we are ever so delighted about it. But my question is, can elite, and this is from Sonia Khan, can elite bargaining justify the dissipation of crucial state institutions of a nation? The crumbling of the election structures is alarming. And in the long run, we not help Bangladesh. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. So, so, look, it's, it's a problem that, that, again, you know, over time, you, many countries experience, actually, some of these kinds of periods. You no, know, I mean, the point is not whether it's, elite bargaining can justify something. It's maybe, can elite bargaining explain the dissipation of some of these kind of things as well? And I think, Akta, you just alluded to it already. You know, one of the things is, you know, when there is an elite bargain for development, you know, it needs to, it, it creates changes in the composition of the elite as well. Some will get stronger, some get weaker. There's new entrants that need to be found. And I, I, I alluded to earlier to in Indonesia, there had to be a way to get new elites to be part of it. Now, you always have to be very, very careful because the underlying political deal can become very stagnant and actually not allow new entrants in it. Your, or your elite can become fragmented, which is, again, you know, the stability may be under threat. And I, I don't know enough about Bangladesh here on the current thing, but if I take your word for it in the question, you know, there is a the dissipation of crucial state institutions could be a sign of actually a, a, a beginning of a fragmentation of an elite bargain that pushes in different things. So it's that whole point about, you know, the renewal that all the time needs, you know, when there is change, you know, you, you, you get, you change relative positions in, in those who control a society and power. Some, sometimes power may become a bit more concentrated. You need to find the one that works for you also developmentally. And I doubt that far more concentrated power is the best way for Bangladesh to do it. I think that's that was one of the lessons probably in the early period as well. And so finding that way, you know, I have no answers for that. I would actually say it's a reflection of change and, and it needs different people, not just, 
your 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 prime minister or your presidents or or a few people, but it needs concerted effort to actually reconstruct and probably in the spirit, in the economic sense, what you are saying, you know, making sure it's open enough for new entrants, maybe more market based, making sure it's keeps on being tradable based and not just now one sector that gets protected and so on and so on. So yeah, it's it's a challenge, you know, it's again that art of policy making. I'm not pessimistic about what Bangladesh has achieved. It may be alarming, you may be alarmed on, on the question, I appreciate that. Comparatively, I'm actually still, you know, rel relatively positive compared to some countries where it's really going wrong. So I kind of hope that Bangladesh finds its way. It's not that it's been an easy route since the 1970s. I, I'm confident that there is enough of a sensible groups and leading groups to actually maneuver in that space. Yeah. Stefan, in many ways, you've actually probably answered the three other Bangladesh related questions which are there. I'll, I'll repeat them. And in case you have something to add, you can. But let's take all the three together. The first one is what would you say are the primary of obstacles which lie in front of Bangladesh in terms of being able to achieve greater economic growth in the future to get to the high middle income category? And this was from Rishik Roy. And then another question is to get to the high middle income category, should Bangladesh defy its comparative advantage, this is from Farashid Sonnet, um, defy its uh, comparative advantage associated with state intervention to have a more diversified export basket to acquire faster growth. And Farashid has another question, which is probably related to what you were just saying. Can countries like Bangladesh move from vulnerable authoritarianism, authoritarian to developmental coalitions, or is it possible to grow fast faster being in the vulnerable authoritarian category. So three yeah. questions. You've covered quite a bit of the ground already, but if you have something more to add. No, it's, 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 it's the, um, I think the spirit of what I answered, I, I can just get the essence there, is that, you know, I think I like to, I've, I've said it to some other audiences, I think Bangladesh should learn from Bangladesh now as well. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, the agility it had to actually move and all the things we've talked about today, we should just not remember that actually your recent history, it's, it's messy. You know, it's not, it's not beautiful. The state wasn't beautiful. Politics wasn't always beautiful. There was a lot of ups and downs even in this period. But somehow it managed to, you know, find a way of renewal at the right moment and then stay the cause and actually re achieved quite a lot in this period. And I think... You know, at any moment in time, you know, yes, the politics looks a bit different than it was 10 years ago. I will be the first to admit to it. The political deal is there, is, is dif different. That's an issue. And you hope that there is enough renewal possible there and, and enough space. Um, you know, and it's it's in politics, it, it's not just one in Bangladesh that, that tangos. It's an, it's usually two that are, that are tangoing there. So, so there is an element there of, you know, can we find at least some consensus about maybe the developmental path around it? Even if, you know, we see that in India as well, there is very different, you know, there is a very, um, how to say, very fragmented politics now, uh, or at least very different views on the direction of the country on nationalism and religion. But actually on the economic front, they're not that far apart. And so there is an element, can we actually get that? Because developmental issues have a lot to do with that economic deal. And that's where I think, the country should make sure it stays the core. So, you know, and it's again, uh, where however much I like a much more open society, if the country feels more authoritarian to, to some of you, it's not in itself the main determinant. It's actually more whether the elite commission, coalition across, across the political divides is actually willing to actually embrace the kind of things that need to be do for economic growth to continue. And that's what you need to do. And the question nine, where about the appeal to the more diversified export basket, I've alluded to it, you know, you need to be willing to, again, ask yourself, are there vested interests? Are we risking to be more crony, crony based economy, groups that are now more control of the economy? Well, that was the success that earlier on, groups were able to emerge, new groups were able to emerge that were not captured by the state or by links to the state. And so that's clearly a lesson from Bangladesh that Bangladesh should learn and renew it and apply it again. And then um, then the other question, yeah, so the, 
and, and again, the development coalition can exist across political divides, even if the country is politically very divided. A, a broadly shared vision on, on development is quite important. And maybe it helps you to say, you know, the development bargain in India, which I think exists probably since the 1990s, it wasn't happening in 91 when the prime minister started liberalize the economy. I actually date it, not when Congress embraced it, but when the BJP made it part of its platform. That's the moment when the development bargain was there. All the main parties were fighting the elections around developmental outcomes. That was the change. If the BJP started doing that, that was important. And I think that's that's a bit where where you still need to think about it in, 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 in this respect. Um, yeah. And, and, and there is a question there, a final one there, which is, um, which is, which is beautifully um, to suggest that, you know, Bangladesh had an agile elite bargain and, mm -hmm. and we can't fully explain how it really functioned, how actually the success came about. Academics are really arguing over it in the books and so on, what essentially was the thing. And we had a bit of an argument over the relative role of the state or not. But the agility was definitely there. It was definitely a certain flexibility to actually do it. Let's hope the current elite keeps on having it, keeps on allowing new entry for new entrepreneurial activity. And this is about young people as well. Allow with new young entrepreneurs to come in and actually play a role in it. I think success will be probably later on judged by people like me to what extent it can overcome that uh, the kind of the risks of, of an elite bargain that gets stuck to something that is much more agile. I'll have my last question on the role of the youth because we are being hosted by the Youth Policy Forum and you had just touched upon that. But there's just one more question which I want to acknowledge is, uh, well, we know the elite bargaining could be a cause of development. It could be an outcome of development as well. And particularly when we talk of the renewal of elite bargaining. Yeah, yeah. no, no. And so, you know, look, and to make sure people understand it properly is that, you know, so I think every society has its elite bargain. When I talk about the developmental elite bargain, developmental bargain, um, you know, you need to have an elite bargain for that. Otherwise, it needs to be a cause there. It needs to be, you need to have it. I don't think it will happen. Sometimes people say, maybe, and in fact, I was talking to some World Bank officials earlier, and they would say, maybe we can start forging it, even though in the country they don't really want it. And I say, no, no that's wishful thinking. You know, you do need somehow to get that elite commitment to actually be successful in growth and development but then of course it's self-reinforcing once you get a particular development bargain you know a new elite bargain has to be struck and in fact we were suggesting it earlier there is a risk that the development bargain comes unstuck in bangladesh uh, it could actually become an, an elite bargain that is more clientelist crony capitalist based or whatever it is that's the kind of thing, the bargaining that these days clearly needs to happen amongst the elite and really consider. And this is, of course, where 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 a new generation actually has to play a role to renew, um, to, to have as an outcome of the success that has been achieved to get a further next stage of a development bargain in the country for further growth and development. And that's obviously what I aspire uh, to for, for Bangladesh. So, Stefan, to all these young people, members of the Youth Policy Forum who were listening in, I mean, the youth, I don't know whether we consider them as part of the elite. Individually, in their personal lives, they may be part of the elite. But as a collective, even if they are not part of the elite, they can actually play a significant role in steering the politics of a country towards an elite bargain or a renewal of the elite bargain. Absolutely. And I kind of, I probably have, have um, about three, three things to say, say on that that I actually just want to, 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 to put. You know, one great thing about youth is that they're optimistic. You know, when you think about development and growth, you have to be optimistic. There's actually research that said optimists will be more successful in it. And we need to be optimistic about the country. And youth definitely has this. But actually, at the same time, you know, they shouldn't, they should be, realistic and not naive about how how systems work don't turn into cynical people which is often all the people do they get cynical about the place actually but be realistic and uh, around it and then maybe the final thing is you know success in development in bangladesh came through a huge amount of pragmatism so you know 
you know, it's not pretty, all these things. You know, it's complicated. It's, it's, it's a bit messy. And I think, you know, being optimistic, being realistic and being pragmatic is actually something that, that in, in many people's walks of life can actually keep on doing this to actually keep on forging something. As long as you keep on having the objective of, you know, how do I actually can help here to nudge things around the development bargain a bit up? How can I strengthen things? And I think that's what they, what, what young people, you know, can do and should do. And I think, um, I think Bangladesh is a great place for it because, you know, compared to a lot of other parts in the world, you know, you're on the up still, you know, there is a lot to achieve there and there's a lot of opportunity there as well. And this is exactly what the YPF, the Youth Policy Forum is trying to do. I mean, they are optimistic in many ways, they are brave, but they're also pra practical, they're pragmatic, and they're trying to understand the complexities of the the policy making processes and and today's conversation was was part of that and we certainly enrich the thinking of the ypfs so professor Derkon, thank you so much for spending well actually half an hour more than we had agreed but this was a very very stimulating discussion i'm sure everyone who had listened and others will listen to the recorded version later uh, will find it fascinating with a lot of food for thought and as I said, will provide a lot of guidance to the YPF going forward. So thank you so much for being with us today. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.